Welcome everybody to the second day of the Gage Sage Community Science Workshop. I'm Beth Pratt-Sutula and I am the project manager. Um, I work for UNAVCO. Uh, I just wanted to give a couple technical, you know, logistical things uh, before we get started. The chat that will be used is going to be the chat that's on the session window that you came in just below the join meeting button that you used. And that's where um, the speakers will watch for questions um, and answer them during the session. Um, in the five minutes after each talk, it is possible to ask a verbal question. You would need to raise your hand. And then um, if you're called on, the uh, host can promote you to a panelist and then you can turn, you can unmute and turn on your video and ask your question. So um, with not any further ado, I will pass it off to William Frank, um, who is uh, the plenary chair. All right, well, thank you so much, Beth, and especially for all your organization making this happen and everyone else that's helped you. So welcome to uh, this uh, session, session two on illuminating transients and earth processes. And um, I'm pretty excited about the talks that we have lined up today. So just organization wise, we have two talks this morning and then we have three talks uh, at the uh, end of the day. And um, I guess sort of the, uh, the theme for this session is sort of clear from the title is that as we have more and more observations coming in um, and we find that all of these processes that we potentially thought before were, were, were continuous in time, we now find that they're transient in nature. And uh, what we really wanted to highlight during the session when we were choosing the the talks that we're going to hear soon are the multidisciplinary nature of picking out and isolating these transients and understanding the processes that are driving them. So without further ado, just to remind everyone, so we're gonna have a pre-recorded talk for 20 minutes during which you can ask questions in the uh, chat on the Pathable website, not, not within Zoom. And then we'll have time for questions. And, um, the uh, speakers and us will try and corral the questions together and highlight them at the end of the talk. So everyone can hear what people are asking and then the responses to those questions. So the first talk is, uh, will be given by Hilary Martins. She's an assistant professor at University of Montana. And the title of her talk is Constraining Hydrologic Loading with Space Geodesy. And so we're gonna hear about um, how we're able to capture fluctuations in groundwater and total water storage to estimate and even potentially forecast for water resource availability. So very exciting. And um, we're gonna have, uh, Hillary's unable to join us today uh, live, but Donald Argus, research scientist at JPL, or Jet Propulsion, La uh, Propulsion Laboratory, will be uh, helping field questions during the talk. So I think with, with, that, with that, we can get started. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this session. My name is Hilary Martins, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Montana. Our presentation today focuses on transient deformation by surface loads, and primarily on deformation caused by the redistribution of freshwater over the continents. Before jumping in, I first want to acknowledge funding support from the National Science Foundation and NASA's Earth Surface and Interior Program, uh, and also thank my collaborators. This group represents a mix of geodesists, hydrologists, and even meteorologists from several institutions. By bridging these disciplinary boundaries in the earth and water sciences, we seek to develop and integrate new data sets, models, and perspectives in order to improve water resource management and also to advance understanding of earth's water cycle and climate. We'll begin with some motivation. Many of us are probably familiar with the current drought conditions that are plaguing the Western US. Reservoirs such as Lake Oroville in California, which is shown here, are at or near all time lows. Under normal conditions, the water level here would meet the tree line. Now, the more accurately that we can assess water levels on land and in the ground over time, the better we can manage our valuable freshwater resources. This figure illustrates drought intensity throughout the Western US and is current as of the last week in July of 2021. Regions that are darker red in color are experiencing more intense drought. Several indicators are used to classify the levels of drought, including temperature, precipitation, soil moisture content, and stream flow. And I've highlighted in the green box here, uh, the drought intensity as a percentage of land area in the Western US. 
So nearly a quarter of the Western US is currently experiencing exceptional drought, which is the highest level of intensity. And nearly two thirds of the Western US is currently experiencing either extreme or exceptional drought. For comparison, here are what drought conditions looked like in the US at the same time of year, so late July in 2019. As we can see, most of the US was not experiencing drought in 2019. And here's what the drought conditions looked like at the end of July in 2020. So we can see here that the drought severity is increasing. And again, here's the current drought situation in 2021, where we now have many parts of the Western US classified under extreme or exceptional drought. Now, what sort of effect does significant water loss due to drought have on the solid earth? Well, by removing water from Earth's surface and subsurface, we reduce pressure that's applied normal to the surface, and this causes the surface of the Earth to rise upward. In 2014, Adrian Borsa and colleagues published a study on the response of the solid Earth to drought. Here, we're looking at an adaptation of one of their figures for publication in the LA Times. Each panel shows vertical displacement of Earth's surface in the Western US through time, starting from March 2011, through March 2014. The squares indicate the locations of GPS stations. As the colors turn from blue to red, blue to red, in the diagram, uh, in the timeline, we are seeing uplift of Earth's surface. And based on that uplift, as well as some assumptions about Earth's structure and mechanical properties, um, we can estimate the amount of water that must have been lost from the Western US during this period of drought. In just one year from 2013 to 2014, an estimated 63 trillion gallons of water was lost from the Western US, which is approximately equivalent to the annual mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet. Okay, but let's back up for one moment and discuss the scientific foundation for our study, which is a phenomenon called surface loading. Surface loading is simply a process by which the solid earth deforms under the weight of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere, and even other masses such as landslides. Um, because the earth is not perfectly rigid, the, whenever we have a movement of mass, we also have earth deformation. And a dominant source of this deformation comes from earth's fluid envelopes, which include the oceans, the atmosphere, and freshwater over the continents. Uh, we can see in the schematic diagram here how the surface of the Earth subsides downward with an increase in surface pressure. This can happen, for example, with an episode of heavy precipitation and flooding. For simplicity, I've removed numbers from this diagram, but the curve depicts the results of an actual model for Earth's elastic response to surface loading generated by the load dev software. Uh, and this software is open source and freely available on GitHub. So I encourage you to check it out if you're interested and feedback and questions are always welcome. So we can also measure the surface deformation caused by loading using a variety of geodetic techniques, such as INSAR and space-based gravity measurements. The particular method that's illustrated here uses Global Navigation Satellite Systems, or GNSS. Now, this is an umbrella term for all satellite navigation and positioning systems, including the Global Positioning System, or GPS, which probably all of us are familiar with. We have these systems in our smartphones, in our cars. Uh, the GPS, or again, more broadly GNSS, that we use for geodesy is just more precise, which has a lot to do with how the data are processed. Okay, so when a load is applied, such as during a period of heavy precipitation, a GNSS antenna, which is anchored into the ground, moves downward and toward the load. On the other hand, when mass is removed from the region, such as when prolonged high temperatures cause water to evaporate, then the surface of the Earth rebounds upward. In this case, the GNSS registers upward movement of the crust, as well as an outward movement away from the region of elastic unloading. As mentioned previously, fluid masses, which are continuously being redistributed around the Earth, are a dominant cause of earth deformation by surface loading. 
And these loading signals are ubiquitous in all geodetic data. So it's important to know something about them regardless of the application. Even if the application is tectonic geodesy or volcanic geodesy, surface loading signals, both transient and ongoing, will be present in the time series and removing them effectively can help to reduce noise and to decipher other transient signals in the data. Now, depending on the source of the loading, the deformation can occur across a broad range of time scales from sub-daily to interannual. The time series here shows GNSS estimated site positions as the blue dots for a station in Brazil. The time series spans just eight days and the vertical displacement range is about 12 centimeters. The black line shows modeled surface displacement caused by loading and unloading from the ebb and flow of the ocean tides. This particular signal from the ocean tides is routinely removed during GNSS processing, but it does contain interesting information about Earth's interior properties. Atmospheric pressure loading also contributes to the GNSS displacements. Here we show a time series for a station in Alaska over an eight month period. The vertical displacements extend over a range of about four centimeters in this case. The blue dots show the GNSS observed site positions and the black line shows predicted vertical displacements due to atmospheric pressure loading, which occurs as high and low pressure weather systems pass through an area. To effectively remove this atmospheric loading signal, we strongly recommend accounting for tropospheric delays based on high resolution numerical weather models during GNSS processing. And this is because the treatment of tropospheric delays can have a significant influence on the retention and then the subsequent removal of the atmospheric loading signal. As another example of loading by surface fluids, here we show an eight year time series, also ranging over about four centimeters in vertical displacement. And this shows seasonal deformation in Alaska, associated primarily with annual cycles of snow loading and unloading. So traditionally, estimates of water storage have been difficult to make particularly for subsurface reservoirs. In hydrology, water storage changes can be estimated using a water balance model, where water lost due to evapotranspiration and discharge is subtracted from water gained through precipitation. The parameters in the model, however, can be difficult to observe and quantify accurately, particularly the evapotranspiration term, uh, and so uncertainties can therefore be large. Hydrogeodesy is an emerging technique to quantify changes in water storage by monitoring ground deformation, uh, as well as changes in Earth's gravity field with high precision. Essentially, we can measure changes in the shape of the Earth um, over time uh, that are caused by the redistribution of freshwater mass. And again, with some additional knowledge of Earth's structure, turn those measurements into estimates of water storage changes or delta S. Therefore, we now have an independent means of constraining delta S in the water balance equation, which is a boon to hydrological modeling and forecasting. We can, for example, use GNSS observations of ground deformation to forecast watershed response to input precipitation, so forecasting seasonal stream flow. When soils are saturated, water runs off the land more easily. When soils are undersaturated, then water can be absorbed into the ground and stored there. Snow can also accumulate over time and cause the ground to subside. This figure compares stream flow with GPS inferred vertical displacement of Earth's crust for a snow dominated watershed in Idaho. So we have discharge versus GPS vertical displacement. The curves here depict the so-called storage discharge relationship for this particular watershed. And we use the GPS inferred surface displacements as a proxy for changes in total water storage. The gray dots show daily stream discharge over a 12 year period plotted against GPS vertical displacements, which we smooth using a 30 day rolling average. 
Those average smooth daily values over the 12 year period are then depicted by the colored circles here, which are colored by month. So at the start of the water year in October and through the winter, snow is accumulating on the ground, which increases storage, but does not have a large effect on discharge. Then in the late winter and early spring, some snow begins to melt and saturates the soils while some water runs off and other snow continues to accumulate in the mountains. And we have roughly steady storage with increasing discharge. In the late spring and summer, all the snow melts and runs off. So we peak in stream flow discharge and then gradually decrease both storage and discharge through the later summer months. Okay, so far, we have focused primarily on seasonal deformation, and we turn now our attention back to longer term signals associated with drought. On the left, we have a map of ground uplift during a period of harsh drought in the Western US from 2011 to 2015. So some regions of California experienced more than two centimeters of uplift during this period. We can then invert the observed uplift for the amount of water that must have been lost from surface and subsurface reservoirs in order to explain that deformation. And the results of the inversion are shown on the right. We find that up to about one meter of equivalent water thickness was lost from parts of California during the drought, which exceeds the estimated water loss captured by hydrology models. So in hydrology, sampling and estimating deeper groundwater storage is a persistent challenge. Um, geodesy, however, has the ability to overcome prior limitations by placing constraints on the total integrated water storage contained in both surface and subsurface reservoirs. So I return briefly here to the drought maps that we looked at in the beginning of the presentation. Here are the drought conditions from July in 2015, which was near the end of the harsh drought shown in the previous slide. And next, we compare with the current drought conditions in 2021, which are even more widespread. So, okay, so what are the current estimates of water loss from geodesy? This new figure from Donald Argus and colleagues shows integrated water storage changes across four mountain provinces in California, spanning a timeline of nearly two decades. Water storage changes from GPS are shown in green and from Grace Gravity data are shown in the light pink. The data sets are staggered here so that we can make relative comparisons of water storage changes. The negative slopes in the geodetic estimates of water storage from 2011 to 2015 indicate water lost during that period of intense drought. We then have a few years of relatively heavy precipitation when water storage increased again. And now we are descending back into another period of intense and prolonged drought. And we are expecting here that the total water in the ground uh, will reach historic lows likely by the end of the summer. Now we can also use geodesy to track water that's gained through precipitation. So most of the moisture that the Western US receives each year is delivered by so-called atmospheric rivers which are just narrow channels of concentrated water vapor in the atmosphere. This animation from January of 2017 shows an atmospheric river making landfall in the Pacific Northwest and along the coast of California. And with that heavy precipitation, we generally expect the ground to subside with subsidence modulated by the rate of runoff. The caveat here would be uh, if the ground has a porous response instead of a purely elastic response, which would be the case, for example, above an aquifer. But this figure illustrates the empirical relationship between elastic ground deformation and precipitation in the Russian River watershed in California. Individual storm events um, can dump enough pre precipitation to induce transient deformation of Earth's surface on the order of millimeters. Uh, over a period of just hours to days. And with spikes in precipitation, GNSS antennas tend to observe short periods of ground subsidence due to the weight of that additional water, suggesting that GNSS can place valuable constraints on the amount of precipitation that's dumped during individual storm events. Which, by the way, 
has also been demonstrated with success by teams out of JPL and in Japan for stormwater deposited on land during hurricanes and typhoons. Before we wrap up, I wanna highlight an exciting and multidisciplinary effort that's now underway with funding from NSF's Frontier Research and Earth Sciences Program. This project seeks to advance modeling and forecasting of water storage and stream flow by coupling geodesy with hydrology, specifically at the scale of mountain watersheds. In this, so in particular, we aim to improve observational data sets for water storage monitoring at the smaller spatial scales, explore empirical relationships for geodesy and hydrology, uh, enhance numerical tools to model surface loading, and also pilot operational products for water resource management. For the first goal, which is to improve observational data sets, we are working to densify GNSS networks in both the Sierra Nevada and Rocky Mountain ranges. GNSS stations that we are adding to the Upper San Joaquin watershed in California are shown in the map at the left. And stations we are adding to the Selway Locksaw watershed along the Idaho Montana border are shown here on the right. Since we have custom designed these networks for the purpose of high resolution hydrogeodesy, we are co-locating weather stations at most of the GNSS sites, which are depicted here by the dual colored circles, for example, here. So our field teams have been highly active during the past year and are continuing to make new deployments this summer. Now, three of our target watersheds are snow dominated, which requires us to dig out some sites in the wintertime to maintain continuous power and data. The larger photograph here shows one of our postdoctoral scholars, Dr. Leah LaJoy, digging out solar panels in the Selway Locksaw watershed just this past spring. And the photograph in the upper left shows a deployment from just a couple weeks ago of a GNSS plus a weather station in California with operations there led by UCSD postdoc, Dr. Ellen Knapp. And then on a slightly longer term horizon, another one of our main goals is to develop and pilot operational tools for hydrological forecasting and water resource management. And on this front, we're partnering closely with the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, as well as agencies involved in the Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations Project, or FIRO for short. So we not only want to advance the science of using GNSS to improve understanding of water storage and discharge, but we also want to remain focused on how these emerging technologies can impact broader society in positive ways, including to investigate groundwater extraction and recharge and to forecast flood and drought risks at low latency. Okay, so in summary, GNSS observations of Earth's deformation response to the weight of surface water and groundwater can quantify changes in water storage and spatial distribution, also help us to constrain hydrological water balance models, constraining that delta S term, and then finally also provide us with information on flood and drought risk. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. We appreciate your interest. Uh, we also welcome your feedback and input. Uh, so feel free to reach out, my email is here. Thank you again for this opportunity to share a bit about our collaborative project. And please stay tuned for more updates as we continue to develop this project further over the next couple of years. Um, I apologize that I cannot be here with you during the live session, but my close collaborator, Dr. Donald Argus, is here to take questions. Um, so thank you very much. Terrific. Thanks um, to Hillary for that great talk, and thanks to Donald for being willing to uh, be here with us. So um, we're open for questions. We have about five minutes for questions, and so you can um, put um, put questions in the in the chat or uh, also as Beth mentioned at the beginning, you can raise your hand um, if you want to ask a sort of complicated um, or involved question. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off and ask one that I actually is pretty related to something that Michael Steckler just um, just put in the chat. Um, 
Hillary mentioned that you know you you of course need to know a little bit about Earth structure in order to take these measurements of deformation and and turn them into an estimate of of water you know water storage or or whatever. Um, Donald, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit on what are the parameters in terms of Earth structure that go into those models. And Michael mentioned specifically, you know, what values do you use for Young's modulus? Does it vary spatially? So a little more detail on that. Um, we're using PREM, it's laterally invariant, and we're finding that solid earth elastic response for water at least doesn't depend very strongly on what we assume for earth rheology. Um, you know, Grace and GPS are assuming the same thing and we, we're not finding very big dependency, except where we have a, a um, aquifer, Central Valley aquifer. And in that case, the response is porous, not e elastic, and it's totally opposite. Mm -hmm. So we cannot use sites above groundwater basins to infer water change. Gotcha. Okay. So the, so the strategy is sort of to av avoid the sites that are, you know, that are right. right. We, el we eliminate all the sites in the aquifers. And we can identify them by seeing when the time of maximum vertical position is, if, whether it's in April or if it's in September. If it's in September, it's elastic. If it's in April, it's porous. Gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Interesting. Um, we have one other, another question that's come in, a lot of great talk uh, comments. Another question that's come in from Sarah Stamps. Um, what kind of monumentation is being used for the new sites? Um, I don't know the answer to that. You'll have to ask Hillary okay. and the team. A <laughs> question directly oh, for Hillary. Um, uh, Rick Astor has made a comment slash question um, is pointing out that surface wave um, ambient noise, hydro seismology, uh, sensitivity kernels um, are highly complementary to this kind of GNSS based approach. Um, and, and have different depth resolutions. So um, he was wondering about the prospects for joint inversions maybe of GNSS uh, data as well as um, ambient noise seismic data. Um, can you please repeat the name? And I did think I'll have to follow, we'll have to follow up on him. And that yeah, one. so it came, the question came from Rick Astor. So maybe, okay. maybe follow up directly. Um, yeah, oh. I don't so know right away, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, something maybe for many of the folks in the audience here who think about this to to um, think further about. Um, so Bex has her hand raised, but she also put something in the in the chat that uh, the monument question. They are uh, 1.5 meter stainless masts bolted to bedrock. So there, there's the um, there's the answer on the monument. Thank you, Bex. <laughs> Thanks, Bex. But one All thing right. I could mention. Uh, if people yeah, go want ahead, to be able to contact Hillary, you could just find, you know, direct message her if you don't know her, you know, I guess her email was in the talk, so you could look it up there, or you could use the the meeting chat, uh, meeting attendees messaging system, and uh, that'll go on to her email as well. Excellent. Thanks, Beth. Um, all right. I'm going to suggest maybe we move on to the next speaker. Um, thanks very much, Donald, for um, stepping in to answer questions. Did Bex did get promoted to, do, sorry to interrupt. Bex, did you have something else to say besides the, um, pan, you got promoted to to a panel. You could speak if you wanted to. Congratulations, you Bex, you've been promoted. Mm, no? <laughs> I think she, I, I got the sense I think maybe it was she just, just wanted okay. to chime in on the monument sorry. question, but yeah. All right. Well, um, that, was a, you know, that was a wonderful talk. I'll just highlight to, to Donald that there are, a few other questions that are coming on in the chat on the Pathables website, if uh, you can keep, I, I suppose, that interaction going while we get this next talk started. And so- well, this, I, I can't see the- So it's the, the chat is on the website that you click to start the Zoom meeting, not the Zoom chat itself. But uh, we can- we, we, we can Donald, I can, I can try to send you the link directly. How's that? Okay. Um, so for the next talk and uh, the last talk of this first you know, mini session uh, is going to be from Noah Finnegan, who's a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And he's going to be uh, 
talking to us about hydrological and deformational processes uh, governing seasonal slip in large slow moving landslides. And I'm particularly interested um, in how these uh, big, large scale slow landslides are made up of these little millimeter scale stick slip events that he's gonna tell us about. So I will let um, Noah take it away and uh, thank you for joining us. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk to you guys for 20 minutes about uh, shallow, slow processes um, in, uh, in in landslides in, in particular. Um, so the title of the talk I'm going to give is Hydrological and Deformational Processes Covering Transient Seasonal Slip in a Large Slow-Moving Landslide. <clears throat> and I hope by the end of this talk that um, I can convince you that uh, these are, these the landslides such as the one I'm going to show you, are a really good natural laboratory for understanding not just landslide processes in particular, but um, slow slip phenomena in general. I just want to quickly acknowledge partners, um, particularly funding from the National Science Foundation and partnerships, um, uh, especially the NAVCO, who, who really um, facilitated a lot of the measurements that I'm going to show you today. Okay. Also, just like to thank um, graduate students past and present um, who have been really integral um, in the work that I'm going to share with you today. John Perkins at USGS, who's actually not, not as a graduate student, but in his work at the USGS has been really helpful in understanding the hydrology of the system I'm going to describe to you. And then Alex Nearson, whose PhD really created the foundation for the infrastructure I'm going to uh, talk about today. And finally, Colleen Murphy, a, a current graduate student at uh, UCSC. <clears throat> Thanks also to um, a, a number of colleagues, especially at Santa Cruz and other institutions um, who are too numerous for me to name, but um, please just uh, want to acknowledge them briefly here because without their insights, um, I, I wouldn't um, be where I am today with this project. Okay. So the motivation for the work that I'm gonna present here and, and more generally for um, this talk is that is as follows. Like faults, landslides exhibit slow sliding and catastrophic failure with transitions between. However, uh, in contrast to faults, prediction of landslide behavior is hindered by a lack of consensus over the constitutive relationship for modeling slow landslide motion, and in particular, its transition to catastrophic failure. And this is due, at least in part, to a paucity of monitoring over temporal and spatial scales that are really required to constrain the mechanics of landslide failure. Um, so that's really going to be the focus and emphasis of the talk today. Um, this point is really nicely illustrated in a recent paper by Al Handwerger, who um, presented data from the um, widely publicized Mud Creek landslide on the Big Sur coast of California shown here. And what was really interesting about this landslide was that it was a creeping landslide for years. And then on one beautiful May day in 2017, it failed catastrophically and wiped out nearly a kilometer of Highway 1. Um, and so, of course, um, the, the question is, why does this happen and, and how can we better predict it? Um, and there have been some, not surprisingly, some um, mechanisms that have been proposed to explain how um, landslides transition from creep to catastrophic failure. Um, so let's just, this is a nice summary by, from a paper by Pascal Lacroix and co-authors um, called The Life and Death of Slow Moving Landslides, which summarizes sort of the thinking about processes governing slow landslides and their transition to catastrophic failure. And so here's just a plot of displacement versus time. This is very typical of at least slow landslides in California where there's a seasonal acceleration followed by dormancy during the summer. Um, but in this schematic, we see that there's a transition to catastrophic failure, which at least in the case of the Mud Creek landslide was observed um, and, and uh, with some subset of these landslides occurs. So, um, so one idea for this is, um, that it, uh, as we'll talk about later in the talk more, one, one mechanism that has been proposed for stabilizing slow frictional slip and landslides is, di is dilatancy in particular. If you have shear induced dilatancy of pore spaces in the shear zone, you can um, increase porosity and lower pore fluid pressure and thereby increase friction in a transient way. However, you cannot dilate a material indefinitely. At some point, it will reach that critical state porosity, which at a point it's uh, material, granular material can no longer dilate. And that negative feedback 
uh, disappears, at which point you can expect there to be catastrophic failure. And indeed, this is what's observed in laboratory experiments that look at this dilatancy effect. So that's one possibility. Another, if you believe that these landsites are governed not by a frictional rheology, but rather by fluid rheology, um, then you can have some kind of nonlinear viscosity that uh, has a yield strength associated with it, at which point you get what's called the viscosity bifurcation, where the, the viscosity uh, is reduced above some kind of threshold stress. So that's something that's been invoked to explain catastrophic failure. Um, Alternatively, um, you can appeal to sort of a transition from distributed shear to localized shear related to the sort of coalescence and growth, the growth and coalescence of subcritical cracks. And then finally, from a rate and state friction perspective, you can appeal to sort of a transition from rate strengthening to rate or velocity strengthening or rate strengthening to rate weakening behavior, which is associated with localization and acceleration. Okay, so these are all valid uh, ideas that have been proposed and the, the question is um, how do we narrow down um, and, and what I hope to show you today is some field observations that will help us to do just that. So where we're going to do this is at a location called the Oak Ridge Earth Flow Observatory, um, whose acronym, not named by me, I have Alex Nearson to thank for that, is Oreo. Um, Oreo is located um, in the East Bay, um, sort of just to the northeast of San Jose. Here's San Francisco, here's Santa Cruz. Um, here's a LIDAR hillshade showing you an outline of the earth flow. Um, it's a very typical of, a, of an earth flow in, in California in the sense that it has a sort of cauliflower-like head scarf with a narrow, fast-moving transport zone sometimes described as an hourglass shape. Key stats here, it's about 1.35 kilometers in length. It drops about 400 meters, has an average slope of about 15 degrees, which is pretty typical of these types of soil land sites. Um, also typical is that it's pretty shallow, about 10, eight to 10 meters, we think. That's constrained from um, electrical resistivity measurements, uh, electrical resistivity tomography. Um, and so these are very long and very thin. Um, from uh, Analysis of air photos over the last 80 years, Alex Nearson showed that depending on where you look on the surface of the land side, you have something like one to 300 meters of displacement. Um, so it's quite active. Um, and importantly for this talk, um, the landslide as most low slow landslides in the state of California um, occur within the Franciscan Melange, which is whose outcrop in the Bay Area is shown in purple here. And the Franciscan Melange is the exhumed subduction uh, is rocks from the, that, that accommodated the shear between the subducting Farallon plate and North America when the coast of California was a subduction zone rather than the strike slope margin that it currently is. So what's significant about this is just that um, we're going to be looking at a slow slip phenomenon um, and which I'm going to try to make an explicit link to subduction zones. And it's just important to recognize that the rocks that we're talking about, these slow slip phenomenon occurring in within landslides, are themselves exhumed subduction channel rocks. We have a lot of infrastructure out there, but for this talk, we're really just gonna focus on um, three GPS stations spaced 100 meters that are along the axis of the land side. Those were installed by UNAVCO. They're uh, continuous and, and currently out there recording as we speak. Um, and then we have two extensometers, vibrating wire extensometers, which are much more precise, and those cross the lateral shear margin of the landslide, again, 100 meters apart. But um, unlike the GPS, which are in the center of the landslide, these actually span the, sh the shear zone, which is a, an active strike slip fault on the side of uh, uh, Earth flow here. Here's just a quick schematic to show you how those extensometers are uh, installed. This is Colleen Murphy installing the, the vibrating wire extensometer. Here's a schematic showing you the shear zone. The orientation of the, the, the extensometer relative to the shear zone. Um, and here's what that shear zone looks like up close. It's uh, very localized. Um, these are silicon sided surfaces with the roots of annual grasses that kind of get aligned in the, in the orientation of the shear. And so we're very confident in the location of the shear zone and in our ability to put an instrument across it that can measure that uh, displacement. Okay, so. Motion at Oak Ridge Earth Flow 
um, occurs after an abrupt water table rise to near the landslide surface. It occurs something like 50 to 130 days after seasonal rainfall commences. And this delay between when rainfall begins and when we see a poor fluid pressure rise really reflects the difficulty of getting rainfall through that unsaturated vado zone that sits above the water table um, following California's dry summer. In the Franciscan Melange, that Vedo zone thickness is quite consistent um, where it's observed throughout the state. Typically around three meters of unsaturated weathered rock sits above the water table. Um, and because the uh, transmission of water through unsaturated ground is extremely nonlinearly dependent on the moisture content, what you see is um, an initial early season delay followed by a rapid increase in pore fluid pressure as that Vedo zone wets up and approaches saturation. So, if we look at rainfall on the top panel here and then poor fluid pressure measured at various instruments at various depths, we see something typically like this where there's a long decline of pressure during the summer. These negative pressures actually reflect tension um, in the soil, unsaturated soil pores above the water table, followed by a really, really sudden and rapid rise. Um, indeed, in this particular year, 2016, 2017, we observed something like 80% of the total poor fluid pressure rise observed in the year over two days. So it's an extremely nonlinear. In other words, you, you have nothing happening and then all of a sudden, boom, as you approach saturation, um, all that water that's being held against gravity in that Vedas zone in tension um, can be transferred to the water table all at once and you get this big rise in port pressure. When that rise happens, you see acceleration in the landslide. This is uh, GPS data here. Um, in this case, averaged over 11 days. And you see that, um, you know, coincident with that rapid rise in pore pressure, where the water goes to near the surface of the landslide, we see the landslide begin to accelerate. And we get this long seasonal acceleration and deceleration of the landslide. Um, the same thing is observed in the extensometer data, which is over a narrower time frame than the GPS data. Um, and it, but the important difference is that whereas we can average these things over 11 days, we can actually look at these data over a 10 minute window. They have a, a, a precision of 0.04 millimeters. So that's gonna be really important for uh, this talk. Okay, if we look um, at that sort of relationship between the sliding velocity and the poor water pressure shown in this center figure here, we see that there's this beautiful nonlinear uh, relationship between the sliding velocity as measured by whatever instruments, either GPS or, or extensometer, and poor water pressure. This is similar to observations in other slow moving landslides, in this case for one in the Alps. This is uh, just the same set of axes rotated. So we have pore pressure on the Y axis instead of the X axis, um, but you get the similar sort of relationship. And indeed, when you take landslide materials and put it into a ring shear where you bring, uh, the material to failure through rising poor water pressure, you can also, you get a very similar sort of relationship. These are data from John Kerry at the Geological Survey of New Zealand. <clears throat> so the question is, what's the process, right? Um, what, what, what set of physics gives you this type of relationship? And what we've discovered is that um, there's a pretty rich and interesting story when we look into the extensometer data that sheds some light on these physics. So here are three displacement records measured by one of those uh, extensometers that crosses the shear zone over a 16 hour window, one on February 24th to 25th, 2019, one during a period with more rapid displacement during March 4th to 5th, 2019, and then finally one over a really period of really rapid displacement from February 18th to 19th, 2019. And I should just emphasize that during periods um, when the landslide is less saturated, we can see daily um, thermal expansion and contraction cycles due to solar heating and cooling at night. Um, and importantly, that, that displacement, which is a couple meters, a couple millimeters due to thermal expansion and contraction is smooth. So the displacement on this instrument is not intrinsically um, a stick slip phenomenon, rather, it's only the displacement of the landslide itself that is manifested as these beautiful stick slip motion from which we infer that this is a, 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 telling us something about the actual physics um, of displacement of the landslide. This is more clearly seen if we detrend those displacement signals, and that's what the center column shows you. Um, and, and finally, the, the third column shows you just the delta displacement between the 10 minute um, measurement uh, intervals on this particular instrument. And, and what these data kind of, uh, the red bars are just kind of what that precision is associated with this instrument. So uh, it's only displacement above that red bar that we're kind of 
confident is real. And what you see is that the, the displacement is um, uh, occurring through tiny stick slip events that are something like a fraction of a millimeter up to just about a millimeter, right? So hopping along and these occur with a frequency of every 10, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Um, What's more, um, the slip events are clearly triggered by elevated uh, or are clearly associated with elevated pore fluid pressures above a, th a threshold. So if we look at that bottom panel here, this is pore fluid pressure measured at a particular vibrating wire piezometer that's buried at 4.2 meters depth, so about halfway above the failure plane of the land side. And what we see then if we look at the top panel is velocity measured by those extensometers <clears throat> for the middle and, and upper, uh, the two extensometers we have. They're somewhat decoupled, which is interesting, but importantly, if you look at the frequency of slip events that are larger than um, 0.12 millimeters, which is three times the precision of the instrument, we see that um, these patterns are really, really close to one another, which is just another way of saying that um, the primary way that displacement is accommodated in this landslide is through these tiny stick slip events. So this is the way that the landslide moves. Um, I should just also emphasize cross-correlation analysis shows that there's no consistent um, lag between the extensometers and, and there's a really poor correlation between these things, which just tells us that these things, there's no consistent sequencing of the slip events between the two extensometers, which are spaced 100 meters apart, from which we can infer that slip is occurring on asperities that are smaller than that 100 meter distance between um, the extensometers. So what's the physical interpretation of that? Well, in Franciscan Melange, um, which is a clay matrix with hard blocks of sandstone, chert, and greenstone, those hard, among other things, those, those hard blocks really account for most of the strength. This is a plot of the friction angle or coefficient of friction, if you take the tan of that, as a function of that block percentage, just emphasizing that it's really those blocks, that heterogeneity that gives strength. Um, so Here's just a typical Franciscan Melange landscape. I'm gonna highlight with yellow arrows, those boulders that are weathering out of the rock and, and um, just emphasize, and it's really our interpretation at least is that it's those, those maybe individual boulders that are accounting for the strength. In other words, that rising poor fluid pressure in the winter results in decreased effective normal stress and therefore decrease in friction. So these slip events may well reflect failure on individual asperities that could correspond to individual boulders and which certainly um, are, are, I don't know, which are likely too small to exceed the critical size that would be required to trigger dynamic rupture. And this is a, akin to what um, two papers, Al Handwerger and Adam Booth, and that should say 2018 for Adam Booth, not 2016. Um, two papers that they've written um, where they are actually trying to use rate and state friction to explain landslide behavior. So this is, although we're kind of resolving the details of the friction a little bit more than these studies were able to do, it's, a, it, I would say, very um, complementary view to these two papers. And I should just say, this is very similar to mechanisms that have been proposed to explain slow slip events in subduction zones, um, and may be particularly relevant to shallow slow slip events at the updip limit where pressure and temperature conditions are likely to be similar to a landslide. And again, it just emphasized, these are the same rocks, right? We're looking at the same rocks. Okay. So from a rate and state friction perspective, I see I have about a couple minutes here. Um, and, and here I, I thank my colleague, Heather Savage, um, for sort of helping me to contextualize these observations. Um, slow landslides likely exist in that kind of conditionally stable regime where your system size um, for a given stiffness is right at that sort of critical patch size at each star where you can kind of, you're at that bifurcation between stable frictional sliding and catastrophic failure. It, it, it's a state where um, oscillatory stick slip motion is believed to be able to occur. Here's sort of a, um, a, a nice figure from one of Chris Schultz's papers just showing um, something which he infers to be a manifestation of um, a frictional regime in that sort of conditionally stable regime, in this case on the creeping section of the San Andreas Fault. Alternatively, or in addition, there may be dilatant strengthening happening again, where shear induced dilation of pores causes transient drops in pore fluid pressure and increases in, in, in friction. And this has been observed, for instance, in experiments at the USGS debris flow flume by Dick Iverson, beautifully here, where we see these sort of stepped displacement, which is associated with drops in pore fluid pressure measured within an experimental landslide. 
<clears throat> Oops, that's the wrong way. Okay, so to conclude, slow landslide motion at Oak Ridge Earth Flow is accommodated clearly via millimeter scale st stick slip events. And this confirms that slow landslide rheology is indeed frictional rather than viscous, which is something that is debated um, among landslide scientists. Slip events are triggered by elevated pore fluid pressure and occur, seem to occur in asperities that are smaller than 100 meters in scale. And that's based on those two extensometer records. The lack of catastrophic failure that observed is likely related to the small size of frictional asperities, which is something that's also been appealed to for slow slip areas in, in subduction zones. But there may also be a component of dilate and strengthening here, which is again something that Siegel and Rubin and others have proposed for uh, subduction zones. Finally, uh, seasonal slow slip on landslides, uh, as I hope I sort of hinted at. Um, I think shares a lot in common or may share a lot in common with slow slip events along faults. Um, and I think if there's one thing I could leave this community with, it's this, that um, it's really easy to make measurements in landslides relative to subduction zones. Um, and so I hope I can show you that, you know, we can measure pore pressure and we can measure displacement. And so um, if anything, I think these are a really underutilized natural experiment, not just for looking at landslide mechanics, but really for understanding slow slip phenomena in general. And then this is a point that Joan Gomberg, I think deserves a lot of recognition for um, seeing early on and, and writing a couple of nice papers um, on some going earth flow in Colorado. So I'm out of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop my recording and thanks very much. Excellent, thanks uh, Noah for a fantastic talk. I My mind is completely blown in a great way by <laughs> thinking about the the analogies with the you know slow slip and subduction zones at the landslide. So fantastic. We'll open it up for questions. Um, so again, people can feel free to raise hands if they want to um, actually you know be on camera and ask something. Maybe we can start with a question that uh, Roland Bergman has put in the chat. So um, do your observations support the use of a simple pore pressure diffusion relation when trying to estimate conditions at the base of a landslide and get at the delay between onset of seasonal precipitation and landslide motion? Yeah, uh, in short, no, unfortunately. Um, we uh, we just published a paper in JGR or Surface that kind of goes into this, but because of the details of the Veda Sun hydrology, it's an extremely nonlinear diffusion problem. So you need to account for the changing moisture content in the ground and its in turn its effect on the uh, hydraulic diffusivity which changes by orders of magnitude. Excellent. Um, Cindy Evinger has just pointed out that this um, there are analogies, maybe not just with processes on the mega thrust, but also slow slip and so slow slip in other settings like rift and passive margin growth faults, which is an excellent point. Um, from Emily Brodsky, um, so are you suggesting the Big Sur landslide occurred on a nice day in May because that was the time lag to empty the Veto zone since the last rain? Probably not. No, I don't think so. Um, just based on looking at the, the velocity had peaked already and was actually decelerating when that failure happened. So there's probably something else related to the, the strain history, I would guess. Interesting. Um, let's see, from John Vidali, is there a magnitude frequency relation for the slip episodes that can be related to slow slip or regular earthquakes? Yeah, I, could, I just started sort of thinking about this. I mean, they have a power law distribution with some exponent that's kind of similar to what you see. Um, I sort of lacked the context to sort of really evaluate the significance of that, but I obviously have good colleagues that can help me with this. So um, that's sort of on the to-do list. Something interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, one, one more comment from uh, Doug Weens. There are a lot of similarities as well with glaciology. Mm -hmm. So um, he points out that Paul Winberry and Grace Barczyk have some nice papers showing that the motion of the um, Willens ice stream is composed of many micro ice quakes, <laughs> perhaps associated with cobbles in the till. So another- Yeah, I mean, great, Grace was a PhD student at Santa Cruz. So certainly Excellent. like her ob Thank observations you. are um, yeah. foremost in my head. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I'll ask maybe just one more question. Um, you know, you you pointed out that the you know there's one of the reasons this analogy with at least megathrust processes is so good because this these are taking place in the Franciscan Melange and and the, it turns out that the rheology is maybe dominated by these big blocks. How how different would you expect the behavior to be 
in a region that had a totally different lithology? And is there any data on that? Yeah, I mean, there is slum gullion is in is in hydrothermally altered volcanic rocks, right? So it's a completely different setting. So uh, what I can say is the common thread is clay, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but I'm not. It's not clear to me that it, the clay may be the, the weak the weak part of it that it enables you know you. So I think probably clay is really is obviously really important. Then some heterogeneity, um, but it may not come from something as sort of obvious as what you see in the Franciscan launch when you're in the field. Um, there might be more subtle variability. For example, just variability in hydraulic conductivity due to fracture distributions could probably generate stress heterogeneity that would probably do the same thing, but wouldn't have an obvious signature in the field. And my colleague, Heather Savage, is quick to point us out that I, I always want like a visual of this is where the stress heterogeneity comes from, but she's like, you know, it, it could be just subtle variability in the hydraulic conductivity that's driving everything. Oh, interesting. Very cool. All right. I think in the interest of time, we're going to want to move on. There are some more um, comments in the chat, so please keep the discussion going there and we'll move on to our next thing. So over to Beth, I guess. Thank you so much, both speakers and Don for um, doing the question and answer. Yes, at the hour, we will have the next set of sessions start, which is four different e-lightning poster sessions. One of them is actually on sort of geophysics and hydrology. There's one on faults and another on tectonics and another which includes paleo seismic and also workforce development. So I say, let's sign off of this and I will see hopefully many of you or some of you in um, the next session. This plenary will continue um, in the last session block of the day at five o'clock Eastern time. All right, thanks, bye. Thanks again to all the speakers.